It's good to see you in church today. It's good to be here. Good to see some folks that have been out sick. See that you're back. And uh, thank you for praying this week for little Camden. My goodness, that little guy was in bad shape. I tell you, he's doing pretty good today, huh? He's doing better. Amen. So continue to pray for him and uh, ask the Lord to continue to heal him up. That was a that was a bad situation. And it's good to see you all here today. We're going to be in Colossians chapter 4 this morning. Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. Everything in the Sunday school hour for quite a while now has been all under um, the subject or topic of words. Um, I I believe you cannot overemphasize the words in the book of God. I think it's something that needs to be emphasized. And to be honest with you, one of the reasons that so many uh, Baptist churches, I'm not talking about other churches, so many Baptist churches, are, are now straying, if you will, the scripture calls it falling away, um, from the, the old path, the faith as given once to the saints, as delivered once, is because of them not adhering to the words of God. It really is that simple. Anytime you replace one of God's words with another word, anytime you redefine one of God's words with a different definition, Anytime you take one of God's words and use it in a mis, in, in wrong way, in, in, applied the wrong way, you damage the words of God. And folks, listen, um, if, 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 you, if you like studying history, you ought to study the history since the 1900s of a, a group of uh, writings called the Fundamentals. The fundamentals were put out in about 1908 to 1915, somewhere around there. There are 90 articles, 90 written things written that produced what they called the fundamentals of the faith. Now hear me closely. (laughs) They were all Presbyterians except one Baptist who was Charles Haddon Spurgeon's son who was a hyper-Calvinist. But Baptists inherited the fundamentals of the faith in their theology classes because they were too lazy to study the words of God instead of theology. That's a very strong statement. That's been going on since the late early 1900s. We wonder why you can see so many Baptist churches and they don't seem to agree with the words of God. And now many of them are even throwing out the book of God saying, well, it really doesn't matter. You know, the King James is only a translation. Somebody tell me why it's bad to say the King James is only a translation. Why is it bad to just make that statement? It's not a translation. It's an interpretation of the book of God in heaven. A translation can be just about anything. God never uses the word translation for words. (laughs) Never. There's an example of theology saying, well, let me teach you about the translation called the King James. No, if they would teach that it's an interpretation by the Holy Ghost of the words settled in heaven, we'd stick with the words. If we translate, we could use synonyms, different words, look up different words. Well, it's close. We can use that word. We can translate it. We could say that. It's close enough. Is that good with God? Close enough? No. And there there are people who criticize what I just said. Not you folks, hopefully. (laughs) But there are people that will criticize what I just said. Well, that's being too fanatical about the words of God. Oh, really? Let's see if we can learn something more about the words of God today. What do you think? Huh? Colossians chapter 4, let's pray first. Heavenly Father, help us today. Lord, help us to think with your words, read your words, define your words by your words, 
and do what your words say. In Jesus' name, amen. Colossians 4 and verse 3. Praying with all praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance. We're going to go through all these words now. Open unto us a door of utterance, comma, to speak the mystery of Christ, comma, for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak, walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. Now, what can we learn from those words? As a saved man, Paul the Apostle's life, would you agree, was all about words? Would you agree? I mean, his life was all about words. The Holy Ghost used that man. Uh, let, me, let me give you a little uh, scriptural trivia. Who was used to write the most words in Scripture? Moses. Uh, if I remember right, and I'm just going by memory here, if I go by just pages in, in the book that we have, or I, I have, Paul wrote, was used to write about 138 pages. Moses was used to write over three, almost 400 pages. Moses wrote the most words of Scripture, Genesis through uh, Deuteronomy. Paul the Apostle wrote the second most words given by the Holy Ghost for him to disperse to us. The Holy Ghost used that man to write the second most words in God's book. Of course, Moses wrote the most. I like that. That puts the Jew first. Amen? <laughs> God always puts the Jews first in any way possible. As far, and by the way, Paul was a Jew too, but Moses was a Jew who wrote the most, most words. He wrote them to God's people, the Jews, Paul wrote most of the words that he was used to write to whom? Gentiles. Let's keep that in mind. Go to 2 Peter chapter 1. We're going to go back to Colossians. We're going to look at those words because I want you to see how that all fits with, with, with this study about words. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20. You ought to have these words memorized by now. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20. Knowing this first, just by, who has the word first underlined or circled? Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Theology would put the word translation there instead of interpretation. No prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Let's apply that to Colossians 3, 4 through 6. Paul was one of those holy men of God, used by God, moved by the Holy Ghost to write those words. Would you agree with that? He was used to write those words. He was moved to write those words. Moved does not mean inspired. Inspired is not one of God's words. Inspiration is. Moved, Paul was moved to write those words. So they didn't come from Paul's will. Now, let's go back and read those words again in Colossians. Because Paul is asking for prayer here with all, praying also for us that God would open to us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds, uh, by the way, he was in prison when he wrote that, and held by God. Verse 4, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Now, I want you to think about that. Paul wrote many words of the Scriptures, and each of them were 100% perfectly interpreted from God's settled word in heaven, given to him by the Holy Ghost to write exactly what God wanted him to write. But the words in Colossians 4, 3 through 6 
are about Paul first asking others to pray for those words to be able to be used and spoken correctly. Paul was not asking, okay, the words that I'm going to speak from God, let's make sure they're right. No, no, he's saying, help me to express the words that I'm given from God properly. That's what he's saying in Colossians chapter 4, verses 3 through 6. He's asking those people to help him. He, the words that he was given are perfect. They're, they're perfect. Paul didn't need to ask for those words to be uh, corrected. But he did ask, let me speak these words properly. Do you get that? That's what he's teaching there. He says, first, um, open unto us a door of utterance. What is he saying there? Open us to, un, unto us a door of utterance. What do you think he's saying? What do you think God's trying to say there? Dean? Uh, that comes with it, but it's part of it, but it, that's not exactly, he, he's going to get to that next, but uh, think it through, to open unto us a door of utterance. Mark? The Spirit would speak through them. Okay, that the Spirit would speak through them. You're relating that to Acts chapter 2, where the Spirit gave them utterance, okay, of the ability to speak those words, okay? That's part of it also, all right? And, and that is part of it. But what else does utterance tell us? An opportunity, a chance. That's what not a chance, uh, an open door, a door of utterance. Give us, give us the means to be able to say what we need to say. Do you see that? He, he could be saying it like this: Give us the opportunity. Give us the circumstances where we could utter the words of God. Open some doors to us so that we can speak the words of God. Does that make sense? All right. Let's go back to Colossians four and verse three again. With all, praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance. That's the first thing that he asks. Please ask God to open up a door of utterance. How do we apply that to us? Lord, please help me to witness to somebody today. God, give me an opportunity to speak your words today. Lord, help me to say something. Give me, give me the right circumstance to say something from your word. Is that what he's saying here? That's only the first thing that he asks for. Open unto us a door of utterance. Then he says to speak the mystery of Christ. The mystery of Christ. I want you to think of the, the word, the mystery of Christ. Just, just think of the words, the mystery of Christ. What's a mystery about Christ? What's a mystery? Uh, remember in God's book, a mystery is not something that can't be figured out. Okay, he actually says that Paul was given words that were hidden things, mystery that was hidden from the past, but now made manifest. In other words, it was always there. Now it's just made known. Well, what are some of the, how would you relate that? The mystery of Christ. Yeah. God wants the Jews to get saved, but he also wants the Gentiles to get saved. Say it again. He wants the Jews to get saved, but he also wants the Gentiles to get saved. Okay, all right, I can see how that, how you're thinking there. All right, give me some other things about the mystery of Christ. The mystery of Christ. Dean? Just the fact that he's willing to get us, help, have us to be saved. Okay, all right. What else? I want you to think. The mystery of Christ. Okay, all of his accomplishments, all right, after he was here, rose from the dead, all up. Yes? The Godhead. Now you're starting to think. The mystery of Christ. What's, what's, what's one of the greatest mysteries about Jesus Christ? That starts it right there. The Godhead. In him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily? Now, I want you to think along the lines. Folks, what I'm challenging you to do with this study on words is pay attention to the words. The mystery of Christ. What does that cause you to think? I know some of you got some things in your mind. Don't, don't be shy. Say it. What is it? Come on. Sarah? Uh, 
All right, to the lost, everything's a mystery about Christ. To us that are saved, some things are still a mystery. Okay, what are those things? What are, I'm fishing. What are those things that are mysteries? Yes. Holy man and a holy God. Oh, fully man and fully God. Absolutely. That's a mystery, isn't it? Can any of us say we're fully man and fully God? <laughs> no, there's only one third of us that's any good. Jesus was the Godhead bodily. What are the mysteries of Christ? Notice what it says. The mystery of Christ, to speak the mystery of Christ. He's asking the Colossians to pray to God to enable him to have an opportunity, a door of utterance, to speak the mystery of Christ. What are some of those mysteries that you know? Come on, folks, think. Denise? He's the written word, the word made flesh. That is a mystery. How the word that has always been was made flesh. Could you say then, when you looked at Jesus, you saw the word? When you watched his life, you read the word. You saw the word of God in bodily form. When you heard him speak, you heard the word that has always been. That's a mystery, isn't it? Huh? You know, sometimes I think we take our God too lightly. He is a mystery. Do you have them all figured out? <laughs> I sure don't. <laughs> Not even close. What are some things about the mystery of Christ that you understand? Dean? Oh, I don't understand. <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> the bride of Christ? Okay, that's a mystery. We're told very little about that. The word bride is used five times. And it's not the Baptist bride. <laughs> has to do with the city and the gates and the pearls and every other thing that belongs there. I've said this often. If we go in Scripture, the bride of Christ, <laughs> for some dispensationalists to think that it's just Baptists who are saved, they got holes in their head. There's something wrong with them. That is not the bride. Yes, Steve. Yeah, that that uh, 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 I think I know what Brother Sharp's saying. Say the first part again. I'll try and repeat it. With him and the Godhead in us, we are the mystery in Christ. Okay. With him, let's just stop there because I know. <laughs> with <laughs> Is Christ in us? Yes. He is. That's a mystery. I, I don't. I know the Holy Ghost is in us. I know the Spirit of God is sealed. The Holy Spirit of God, little h, Holy Spirit of God is sealed in us until the day of redemption. That's a mystery. I don't, I don't fully understand that. I guarantee you, we walk through our lives, our daily lives, and I wonder how much time we often think, I have the Holy Spirit sealed in me. He's with me right now. He's watching what I watch. He's looking at what I look at. He's reading what I read. He's thinking what I think. He's doing what I'm doing. That's a mystery. Maybe we ought to pay more attention to the mystery of Christ in us. He is the Godhead. And that means in that respect, it's a, you can't separate God. You can't split him up. So if Christ is in us, he's the Godhead bodily. Think about that mystery. That's a tough one. All right. What others? She's thinking of the word that I've hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. The more the words we take in, the more and put out, the more the less we will sin against God. The, the, folks, I think we are allowing our so-called Christianity to be just surface. We are part of the greatest mystery and miracle that has ever been in existence. But is that how our lives are? Are you listening right now? Is that how our lives are being lived? Let's go on with the lesson here. 
Open unto us a door of utterance. This is the Apostle Paul praying for this to happen. To speak the mystery of Christ. He's been given the words of that mystery. Now he wants to speak it. You in this room, you have learned much of the mystery of Christ. You need to be asking God for an open door to speak those things to other people. You know what we focus on? Hey, why don't you come to church? Uh, what about the mystery of the book that we hold? Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. If we don't tell people about that mystery right there, they can't even have faith aroused in them. We ought to be speaking about the mystery of Christ to people. They're used to hearing, come to church, don't do this, don't do that. They're used to hearing that. Maybe we need to speak some of the mystery of Christ and ask God to give us an open door to do so. Make sense? To speak the mystery of Christ. Look at verse 4. That I may make it manifest. That I may make it manifest. You got to put this in order now. He's given the words. God gave him exactly what words to write. He understands those words. Now he's asking for an open door to be able to use those words. And he says to speak the mystery of Christ and that he would make it manifest, to make it known, to make it not just heard, but that's where the understanding comes in. Somebody said understanding. Make it manifest. And if you look at the word manifest, it has to do with a written bill of lading. Make sure that what I say about Christ and the mystery is attached to the words that are written. Always, it always goes back to the words. You remember in Daniel that we used last time? They read in the book of God distinctly, then gave the sense, and then they understood, and then they went back to the words. That's God's pattern. That needs to be our pattern. Folks, this isn't just for preachers. This is for you. I'm going to show you that in just a moment. Open to us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, that I may make it manifest. Is it your desire to make what you know about Christ known to other people? Is it your desire to make what you know about the book of God known to other people? I think believers are too afraid to say what they believe about this. Just in last weeks, I was confronted with somebody who got real upset because I said that the word was made flesh. I didn't say it. God said it. I'm trying to figure it out. I'm just saying what he said. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So if I'm looking at Jesus, I'm looking at the word. He's spoken unto us in his last days by his son. He didn't speak audibly. How does he speak? His son. The word. One and the same. The words. That's Jesus. That's a mystery. That's a mystery. How are you going to explain that? How are you going to explain it to the lost? <laughs> You're not going to. How are you going to explain it to most believers? I get believers getting upset with me because I quote a verse of Scripture? By the way, that's been fixed, just so you know, all right? And in a good way. Think about this. Go to 1 Timothy 3 and verse 16. I think we take our Christianity too lightly. I think we take the mysteries that we, we're, we're a mystery. Hey, here's a revelation for you. <laughs> you ought to be a mystery to yourself. I still cannot figure out how I get to be saved. I can't figure it out. I can read the words, but it's still a mystery. How did it happen? What took place? How did that transform me? Are you a mystery to yourself, or are you just playing church? How's that for a question from your pastor? Are you a mystery to other people? We ought to be, and not in a bad way. First Timothy 3 and verse 16, and 
without controversy, great <laughs> is the mystery of godliness. Now, let me make a comment here. Look at those words. Without controversy, great is the mystery of God. You know what's a mystery today? Christians being godly. How's that for an application? Christians being godly. To God, great, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. In his mind, we ought to be a mystery to other because we're actually living godly. They ought to wonder, why do they live like that? What, what, what motivates them? Why, why are, are you listening? What motivates them? It'd be interesting. Everybody look at me right now. Everybody, please. It'd be interesting to know what a backslidden person is thinking right now. Be real interesting. We ought to be a mystery to ourselves. I'm still trying to figure out why and how God saved me. I can read the words. I can teach how. But it's still a mystery to me that I get to believe this and understand it from the Scripture to the best that a human can. Paul's saying... Give me an opportunity, an utterance to be able to show people the mystery of Christ and help me to make it manifest. Are you listening? Help it make me help me to make it manifest that I may speak it properly. First Timothy three sixteen again, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. <laughs> Do you understand those words? I believe them. I don't know if I can fully explain it, except the word was made flesh. Does that fit? God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto Gentiles, and believed on in the world, and received up into glory. Go to 1 John 1 and verse 14. We already quoted it, but go to 1 John 1, uh, excuse me, John 1 and verse 14. John 1 and verse 14. John 1 and verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as the glory of uh, excuse me, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That's a mystery. The Word made flesh. I don't think we take that as seriously as we should. That is a wonderful mystery. How did that happen? How was the eternal Word made flesh? How was a body prepared for Him, as Hebrews says? The body was prepared for the eternal word. He just became flesh. I think we write off our God as being too small. Here's how I think about God. And I've said it before. Make an eye. Just make an eye. Make a seed. Make a brain. You say, well, they have computers. No computer is as fast as a human brain to pick up thought. A computer can store more, but who puts it into the computer? A human brain. People give the computer more credit than they give the brain that God made to create the computer. There's a thought for you. Paul was asking them to pray that the words given to him from God would be made manifest. And then he says, as I ought to speak. Look at those words. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 4. That I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Notice the word I there. That I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. He had the words of God. He had those. There was no question about that. But now he was looking at his own responsibility to make those words manifest and to speak those words as he ought to speak. Do you see that? There's a great lesson in this about words for us. 
After that request, he then gives instruction about how those to whom he was writing were to use they, their words as they spoke. Look at verse 6. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. I like how God works. He first, listen, he first addresses the one in charge. In this case, the Apostle Paul, who has been given the words of God. Now Paul takes his own, as it his own personal responsibility to speak as he should, hoping that there be an utterance, an, a, 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 a opportunity to give out the words, speaking as, as he should, making the words manifest. He took that upon himself personally. He had the words. Now he had to make sure that all of those words were given out properly by him. Now do you understand that passage of Scripture a little better? With all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I also am in bonds that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without redeeming of the time. Let your speech be all way with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how to you ought to answer every man. Now watch this. Then he, by the Holy Ghost, says why it is so important that this be also part of their thinking. They were not going to be given the words like Paul was. They were going to read them or hear them from Paul. But now he tells them, let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt. He's saying, I'm the apostle. I was given the words of God. Now, if I'm responsible to give them out properly, how about you? Wouldn't that be a way to express that? But this is why, that ye may know how you ought to answer every man. That ye may know how you ought to answer every man. Can I ask you a question? If someone asks you how to be saved, do you know how to answer them? If someone asks you, what am I to get saved from? Do you know how to answer them? If someone ought to ask you, well, what about the Bible? What about the Word of God? Can you answer? Well, what about church? What, what about church? Do, do we have to go to a physical place in church? Or what about church? Do you know how to answer every man? Folks, <coughs> I'll say it again. Here we are in 2024. We take our so-called Christianity much too lightly. We ought to be a mystery to people and not be afraid of it. We ought to understand more about the words of this book than anybody else. We ought to understand what it is, who it is, what its purpose is. We ought to understand more about why we go to church, not just because we go to church. We ought to understand more. We ought to be a mystery. We ought to be a mystery in that sense. That ye may know how you ought to answer every man. It would be very easy to apply this teaching about the use of words only to preachers. And that is the priority. But it's also important for every saved person to be conscious of the purpose of their own use of words. Now, I want everybody to put anything down that you're doing other than listening right now, and I want you to listen very carefully to the next couple questions. Listen carefully. Do you take the words you speak for granted? Are you aware of who hears the words you speak? When you're speaking to someone, are you aware that there might be someone listening? How important are those words to God? How important are his words to you? Why did give man, why did God give man a book? If somebody asked you, why did God give us a book? What are you going to tell them? Because he did. If, God, if somebody said to you, well, why did God give us a book? You ought to be able to have an answer for that person. 
Why did he give us a book? How do those words become part of us? How does it happen? How do the words become part of us? They got to be in us. You remember years ago, I, I, I taught this. I was interested in some of the response I got about it. A little child, a little baby. How do they first learn words? They hear them. They hear them from mom and dad, from their siblings, from others. They can't read, they can't write, they can't diagram a sentence, they don't know what a period, a comma, a colon, they don't know anything, but they can speak the language. A child can speak the language long before they understand any aspects of that language. We're supposed to be children of God. We're supposed to understand the language as spoken by our heavenly parent and his words only. By the way, your children got their words from you first. And then they get them from words at church. I want you to think about it. How important are words to God? How important are words to you? Why did God give us a book? How do those words become part of us? We're going to stop there for this morning. Have you ever asked God to give you an opportunity for utterance? God, bring someone across my path today. Brother Sharp went to a funeral of a cousin this week, and he's got a big family. And nine people got saved at a funeral yesterday because just on a whim they asked him to speak. He wasn't scheduled to speak there. Nine of his relatives got saved. He said now he's up around 200, I think he told me, somewhere around 200 of his relatives getting saved, and a lot of them because of funerals. An utterance was given to him, and he used it. He's at a funeral. He used it appropriately. He didn't hurt anybody while he was there. Is our Christianity based on words? Come on, folks. Can we really have too much stress or emphasis on the words of God? Father, help us to be people of the words of the book of God. In Jesus' name. Amen.